Ja, meine Damen und Herren. Ladies and Gentlemen, please take a seat. We now come to the three, third round of where is the EU headed to? We had an exchange with Ivan Krustev and Sven Giegold, who spoke about the broad European level and outlined what the uh, new compositions of the party groups in the EU Parliament will mean. In a second panel, we looked in depth at the individual countries, and I was fascinated to see uh, what impact the European elections had on domestic processes in Germany, France, and Greece. So now we are back for a last panel, back to Brussels. And it is about the basic ideas. People expect that their vote has an impact. The high voters' participation on average of 51 percent and the increase in the turnout means that people will take a closer look what political projects will be planned to justify this. I'm very pleased to have experts from different contexts here. And I would like to congratulate first uh, uh, about uh, Reinhard Bittikofer for his successful election campaign. We are very pleased that you could come today. Reinhard has been a member of the uh, Parliament since 2009. Since 2012, he is also a co chair person of the European Green Party, and he is also our advisor in the Europe Transatlantic uh, Advisory Council. Uh, uh, let me also welcome an Anna Frenio, born in Hungary, now living in Paris. She is a free journalist, so she has left a Central European country to work somewhere else, but she writes for many different uh, journals about populism, diversity, and if you want to know, just go to www. Uh, dot at anyafrenu.de. Warm welcome to you, Anna. We are looking forward to hearing more about the Hungarian election results and the resulting uh, tasks. And let me also welcome Lukas Gutenberg, Deputy Director of the Jacques Delors Institute in Berlin. He is an expert of economic policy, especially currency policy, but you also deal about tax law, future projects. You also deal with the issue uh, what will be the future tax policy of the EU. And I'm also very pleased to welcome Professor Dr. Teresa Pulano from Baal. Actually, she is an Italian by birth. She studied philosophy 
and um, wrote her doctorate in political theory. What is interesting is that concepts of political theory and philosophy are used by her to interpret contemporary developments. And then you think, uh, what contemporary moments have an impact on political theory. So this makes her a very interesting panelist for our issue. One of her core issues is whether the European citizenship changes the understanding of the state and Europe of the people, whether it could help to push ahead Europeanization. Well, there are different issues to be dealt with in this panel. We want to take a look at the institutions and the issue of trust by the people. We want to look at liberalism and rule of law and the economy and social policies. Reinhardt, let's start with institutions. Currently, an interesting process is underway to negotiate the jobs to be staffed. But this is linked to an uh, issue of political projects. In our first round, Sven Giegold said that for the first time, the Greens have the opportunity to forge a kind of project contract. What projects are coming up for the EU, especially for the Greens? If we think of a range of urgent issues, such as the financial structure of the EU, perhaps also climate. On the other hand, we have burdens from the past, like the Brexit, and new issues that are now more on the agenda in addition to climate, the issue of a social Europe, innovation, digitalization, China, and again, the European enlargement. What political projects will be on the agenda in the upcoming period? Thank you for the question. I also thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be in this panel. I think the it is more than a 50% opportunity for the Greens to be needed for a majority in the European Parliament. Perhaps not numerically speaking, but in terms of cohesion, especially cohesion between the uh, social democratic and liberal groups is so weak. So that just adding up the numbers will not allow reliable majorities to shape policies. This became obvious already now at the very beginning. Manfred Weber, the forerunner of the EPP, thought he will invite the different democratic groups to discuss the uh, timetable. And he was astonished when the liberals and the social democrats said, well, we will uh, not take up 
an invitation by Manfred Weber. And the Green said, OK, then we sent an invite. And everybody turned up. This already shows that we can play quite an interesting role. Now this outstanding green election result also casts some shadows. We will have a parliamentary group that is much bigger than uh, it has ever been. But almost all the seats come from the northwest of Europe. From the east and the south, there are comparably few seats. If the northwest alone had uh, uh, had an election, one could call it a climate election. It was in France, in Germany, the UK. It really was a climate election. But this doesn't apply to Europe as a whole. And therefore, we, and this will be our real task, to send out the impetuses that we want to send out to shape. And we have about 10%. And we have to combine it with the uh, intentions of other political parties in order to arrive at something more than ad the addition of different issues. But let me first t uh, question the uh, question, where is the EU headed to? Because I think it's a bit too optimistic to my liking. So is the EU really in control? And here I do not mean the uh, strong men or allegedly strong men in the different capitals. Let me just recall that the EU is in an international environment. I just attended the Shangri-La conference this weekend. And there you could see that uh, the US and China signal to the rest of the world stand in line behind us and do not only fight each other, neither the acting U.S. or the Chinese Minister of Defense uh, said it explicitly, but it was clear they said the rest of the world now has to make a decision. And Trump actually makes it clear in every second tweet. The uh, Chinese recently signaled well, it's not necessary for them to export their earths. And I think the EU can only be in control if it is aware of this environment and develops policies that are more than a response to the uh, squabbles between the different political camps, but also find a response to these contradictory camps. And actually, in, in German, uh, the uh, question also uh, says that somebody is in control. Who is in control? Currently, uh, there is a big fight about who are, is allowed to control. This is reflected by this 
battle for the top jobs. But I think the core of the conflict, in my opinion, is that not only the explicit nationalists, but also steadfast Democrats like uh, Karrenbauer and Macron think, well, we should not exaggerate with European democracy and the European Parliament should wait what uh, position is allocated and the Maastricht sentence of the Constitutional Court said that the uh, uh, parliament represents the people and the council represents the second level, the uh, member states. Currently, it's not predictable how this struggle will end, and I'm afraid if the parliament does not go out as a winner or finds a good compromise, that this would be a backlash about uh, for the control of the EU, the commission that used to be the engine of the European uh, project has lost this role, it has become a kind of servant. And if the second institution, the European Parliament, is also cut back, not a lot is left. It will only be deals between the representatives of national interests. And given the international environment I outlined, this uh, is very likely to end in a disaster because if the national is in the fore, the EU is more a field where foreign uh, great powers exercise their it intentions. Well, the issues are easy to list. Many observers will agree with me. The central issues is rule of law. Can we see to it that rule of law is made binding? Uh, much more than at the present here. I'm not totally pessimistic. Let me point out, for instance, that the Romanian socialists are perhaps just making a U-turn forced by the European institutions now after the uh, strong men was jailed the jailed the prime minister says and uh, one year ago she said she does what the prime minister tells her she now says we will stop legalizing corruption the second issue, and it is not in order of importance, the second is foreign policy here. I think I do not have to explain a lot. It is obvious that in order to be able to shape foreign policy to overcome the dogma of unanimity, Europe will not be able to play an international role. Climate policy will certainly be an issue. And I do hope that we can link it to industrial policies. Well, here I'm quite optimistic. Uh, we have reached a point where we can put forward arguments for the need of a European industrial policy 
uh, also based on international competition and that it goes hand in hand with an industrial transformation in an ecological sense. So this could be a pillar uh, to unite different political forces. I think the uh, refugee policy is on our agenda. And I also think when it comes to social policies, we have to make the uh, European stage again a guarantor of progressive standards with regard to minimum wages. It is difficult to accept if each populist makes promises to ensure certain national standards to get majorities. It happened with peace, with children allowance. It happened with the Five Star Movement. Here, the EU has to be a guarantor. Brexit is not a long-term issue. I think Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, and Donald Trump will manage that they are out in November without a deal. Well, trade policy will become a major issue also in the context of industrial policies. And I do think that we should restart or we should start, though this is controversial between Berlin and Paris, to do something to stabilize the uh, Eurozone and take up some of the proposals by Macron. I do not like all his uh, proposals, but in this area, the uh, German politicians have rejected these proposals much too long. And I do hope that the Renaissance group will lead to new headlines. Well, this were already was a lot of food of, for thought in many countries. We still feel the impact of the economic and financial crisis. Reinhardt mentioned the Macron proposals. At the other hand, there is market uh, pressure as a result of the Cold War between China and the U.S. And one point where everybody now feels relieved that it didn't happen, that the uh, right-wing populists conquer the uh, EU parliament, this does not mean that we will have democratic majorities. Could you say something about the French ideas and say what answers should come from the European Parliament, including the Eurozone. Thank you for the invite. Let me uh, point out three points. First, when it comes to the Eurozones, there are many open unsolved points. And though we do not have such a market pressure, it's not so much on the rad radar screen. And the economic indicators have been quite good. So it uh, has left the collective conscience 
uh, well, in Italy, which is a central country when it comes to these issues, we now have a government. We do not know whether they will be cooperative, whether they perhaps even plan to get out. And we do not have the uh, correct tools to deal with such a scenario. Well, there were good proposals made by France. Uh, they were talked down partially by Germany and the Netherlands. And one big problem is that we have nobody in Berlin who can say something about it because they don't have uh, ideas of themselves. The CDU doesn't want it, and the SPD decided not to develop such an approach. A second issue is money. At the European level, we are now discussing how to spend money for the next seven years. And we have to think carefully whether we will do the same thing than during the last seven years or whether we will draw the lessons to ensure some flexibility during the crisis. It was about finding new money to fight the unemployment among young people, and it was very difficult to find this money. I think this should be an issue how to determine the priorities for the next seven years. The third point, social policies. When you look and when we talk about social policies, we talk about transfers, investments in public goods, and the uh, European budget can make a contribution, but it's much too small, being just 1%. So the question is, how can the European level ensure that the national budgetary policy can fulfill its role? So tax justice is an important issue. Do will, how do, will we tax corporations in future? Uh, we also have to speak again about the fiscal rules. These are two very specific points that ha will have an impact on the social policy level in the member states. Do you see political forces that will deal with uh, the issue of tax justice uh, to start such a reform. Here again, this was put on the agenda by Macron, the issue of digital tax is difficult to implement technically but it was on the it is on the agenda and berlin refused to deal with it for one year now an idea was developed in the ministry of finance but at the end of the day the question is Will there be a consensus formed in the parliament? And are the parliament and the commission able to discuss it with the different ministers of finance? Trump But does the intervention by Trump play a major role here, or has the um, EU still some uh, scope for action? Well, with this topic, we could see quite clearly that um, in Germany there is a much bigger fear of a political or economic retaliation. And this is why the will was m much smaller to take certain steps compared to France. But the other interesting question is, and Reinhard has already mentioned it, 
if we want to achieve a capability to act on the European level, then we cannot afford a currency which is put into question with every small downturn. So this is why the major foreign policy questions are closely linked to how we deal with it within Europe and what kind of framework we set ourselves. So, Anna, well, to come back to Hungary, which has a or is stabilizing actually in this right wing political situation in view of the enormous media power of Orban. Um, and the uniformity within the media and the institutions, it's actually remarkable that he missed his objective of gaining two-thirds of the vote. So what would you say? Is this reducing his influence on Europe? I mean, he has won so many enemies also in his own political um, uh, sphere. So. Is Orban still capable of acting as part of the anti-European um, section? And what are the consequences for pro-European forces? Well, first of all, I would like to come back to your first remark. Why a .de? Why do I have a German uh, internet address, web address? Because I've been living in Germany for quite some time, and I just wanted to say that I love Berlin. And now um, back to the populist Hungary. Well, much has, I mean, Fidesz won with 52%. And we had a huge uh, voter turnout, um, which is quite a good result, even though it's not, uh, um, I mean, 52% is still a lot, even though it's not a two third majority. And in the European People's Party, maybe, but maybe not, because they were, um, their participation was suspended right now, um, because they were a bit uncomfortable for the other uh, members of the group because of their restrictive migration policy and the campaign against the uh, American billionaire Soros and uh, some populist measures that were not really considered very nice. But I do think that Fidesz and Orban are doing quite well still. And in his country, he is deeply rooted. He has a um, large support base. And I think that uh, he's also uh, having a certain kind of appeal at the European level. So many people agree to him, but he plays actually the role um, of someone who is saying those things that others simply think of but don't dare to speak out. And when I talk to other colleagues from other European countries, I uh, tend to notice that in the question of migration, Orban has a position where many colleagues didn't say anything, and the whole attention was focused on Hungary. But other states have, with the exception of Germany and uh, some other states who have done a lot, but there were several states in the western and the eastern part of Europe um, who were not really supported in this question, uh, also like France or Great Britain, for example. So Orban is a populist, yes, and he wants this fight. He is. Uh, trying to find the next battle partner all the time. And he is also, um, this is also supported by the EU and others. So he, he actually wants these battles. And what does this actually mean for the progressive forces? I mean, is he invincible? And is he um, leading to a further increase? Or is there a possibility to stop him? and this populism. And one question which is um, discussed very thoroughly in Berlin, but also in Brussels, which is the um, um, provi provision of funds, European funds, and to link this to the rule of law. And in the case of Hungary, it's a little bit more easy than the Polish case, because um, actually corruption 
will be proved or can be proved. So is this one possibility to link this funding to, to stop sending funds? Well, to um, place conditions on the European funding and to call for the rule of law. Uh, Reinhardt has already um, described it in the case of Romania, where the Romanians themselves are trying to actually get a grip on the problem. And in the case of Brussels, uh, Hungary, do we need to do it from, from Brussels? Well, of course, we have to channel him. And this should be done through means of the rule of law. Um, this m might be done by funding and by conditional funding. And I like the suggestion of Sven Giegel to said that we should not stop uh, the funding, but who to take away the freedom of decision from those parties who do not respect the rule of law. So to use um, all the different tools of uh, rule of law and not so much to answer with political answers, um, but with um, tools of the state and the rule of law. Teresa. Um, so voter turnout, which was a major issue on Sunday. Um, is this a proof of confidence of the European citizen societies? And can we build on that uh, also in view of the fact that the citizens who did not go to the polls um, in the previous election, but now they did go to the polls, want to go into different directions. So this higher voter turnout, for example, in Poland helped the Peace Party. In Germany, it helped the Greens largely. So what can we learn from that uh, for the European project? And can we find an approach for the question, how can trust in the European project being strengthened. Thank you very much for your question and for the invitation. Um, I would answer your question going back to some of the points Reinhardt made before. I would say that the higher turnout is definitely a proof of politicization of the European space. Nevertheless, it's not at all a proof of uh, trust in the EU. And for me, the core uh, dividing lines are the relationship between uh, the uneven development of Europe from the space uh, side. Reinhardt before talked about the division of support for the Green Party in the West and North Europe and its lack of support uh, in the South. In Italy, the Green Party did not go through the 4% uh, barrier to be elected in the European Parliament. For me, this talks about inequalities that are also territorial, regional and spatial inequalities. And these inequalities are affecting the way in which European citizenship is perceived and structured. And I will be more precise on that. Uh, for me, the core question here is to reverse, and I think this is also a task in the European Parliament and the, in the European institutions, to reverse uh, the shift that has happened in the 80s and 90s in the European regional policies. European regional policy until the 90s were, was characterized by 90s or 80s by Keynesian uh, understanding. So by the idea that European Union should promote solidarity across the EU. Then in the 90s, the idea of competition uh, was the, the main one. And from there, uh, there started to be a policy at the EU level and at the national and at the regional level, putting European cities, European regions, European nation states in competition one with the other. And this has widened the economic gap and the uneven development in terms of space gap. And I think that this explains, I will be provocative, both the results of the Northern League in Italy and of the Green Party in Germany. I am provocative, a provocative associating these two parties, of course. But we have to understand that Salvini's Northern League is a party that has now won throughout the country, also in the south. They have taken lots of votes from the five-star movements in southern Italy. 
And what they will do with their uh, majority now in the government is passing the law concerning the autonomy of northern regions in Italy. So they will sharpen these kind of neoliberal policies within the country. And in, in, in a certain sense, they understood the transnationalization and the territorialization of European politics and of identity and citizenship. And for me, the Green Party in Germany and the European Green Party understands territorial policies in a progressive way. The Green Party is also a transnational party and it has in the issue of space and uh, ecological transition its core element. But I will just add one thing and then I will stop. Uh, Reinhardt spoke about the link between the ecological transition and industrial policy. And I think this is very important, but I would add one point. For me, the real struggle over Europe, it's both a political and an economic one today, and it's the struggle over the what I would call the um, social order of Europe. And this is the struggle over the spatial order of Europe for me, but we don't have to forget that it's also a struggle about how class and class division is redefined today in Europe. And this is central for citizenship. And it's important for industrial policy for me because as uh, the study of Bastian van Hapeldoorn has shown, uh, looking at the uh, um, industrial, uh, at the round table of in European round table of industrialists, uh, class and especially the elite, the economic and industrial elite and financial elite, it's today transnational. And the question is that is that how do political forces who want to pick up the citizenship space nexus in Europe from a progressive way, how do these forces link the question of the trans transnationalization of class, industrial economy, ecological transition, and uneven development? Thank you very much. This is a very interesting connection between citizenship, nationalism, and transnationalism, because this is also um, a point that I was expecting from Ivan Krastev, who wrote a lot about it. But uh, you want us to say something about the social aspects, Lucas, I guess? Well, I just wanted to uh, push back a little bit here in order to start a discussion. Um, I think the empirical data is not fully correct. If you take a look at what has happened over the past 20, 25 years, then the average income in the different member states have dramatically come closer together. This is particularly true for Eastern Europe which is also a result of the structural policy, but also uh, true for Southern Europe. Uh, what has not changed through Europe is the fact that we have huge regional disparities, which were existent in the past and which are still existent, and they are accentuated through the fact that in the overall economy, we are going away from a producing economy, which is not exclusively happening in large cities, but uh, towards a industry or economy which is more service-oriented and focused on the metropolis, on the major cities. And this is why regional disparities in the member states are becoming more fierce. However, the idea that um, the single market would have led to major disparities um, between different countries or regions is not correct from my point of view. And um, of course, are we going to say it is also a task of Europe to see to a better distribution within states? Of course, we could do this, but then we could should give different tools to the EU, or isn't this asking too much from the EU? If we say, for example, the EU uh, is responsible for creating a more a even distribution, well, the provocation uh, worked out, and Anna wants to say something now, and then Reinhardt. Well, I prepared a few points. Maybe I can um, um, read them out later on. But one of my points would be, well, we should take the wind out of the sails of the populists. And one of the problems that we've seen in Hungary and other Eastern European countries is that the EU accession 
actually did not fulfill the dream that those peoples had of Europe. Uh, let's take Hungary as an example. In Hungary, a teacher today earns 300 euros per month, and a doctor at the end of his career gets 600 euros per month. And there is um, a widespread bitterness in the country that uh, dreams didn't come true, that um, we still cannot live like people in Germany. Well, Reinhardt, um, the issue of freedom of movement and the perception of the citizens that the freedom of movement um, shows this um, view, turn or is, shows the turnaround that the Bulgarians and Romanians um, are actually uh, leading to a brain drain in those countries. So uh, people are trained in Central European countries and s pick up a job in other European countries. They em em migrate. So this leads to an increased perception of inequality or injustice, maybe not based on figures, but um, based on what the citizens perceive. Well, just to make one thing clear. I don't want to say that we have um, similar living conditions everywhere. And of course, it's an important objective of the EU. And this is why we have certain structures. Um, and I said, well, we could do this. Um, we could um, try to or say that the EU should see to um, a more equal distribution within different countries. But then we should give the EU more tools and other tools. So, of course, in Eastern and Central European countries, we have an, uh, an improvement of the living standard. Um, it's still not where, um, where it should be compared to the West, but of course there was an improvement. Yes, but it also led to a migration within the EU. And as a result, uh, the UK considers Eastern Europeans as worse enemies than other migrants because the Eastern Europeans are there in the country and they take away jobs. So it's a source for identity policy and also the possibility to play out the national card against the background of this domestic migration within the EU. Well, I'm not quite sure whether these dis Parities can be addressed with a national paradigm. So um, I'm not sure about that. When the Institute for Economic Research in Halle explains that the Eastern German uh, rural areas um, should be supported in order to maintain the villages there. This is actually not a national question. I think we can make much more progress in many countries by addressing the disparities between the rural areas and the cities. And this can also be seen in the election results. There are similarities in countries that are otherwise very different. And of course, I do agree to Lucas in, in the following. If the EU was not only provided with 1% of the uh, gross domestic product of the GDP, and of course, we had to fight with uh, Con Bendit um, to not call for 10%. We managed him to uh, lower it to 5%, but even this was unrealistic. So. Um, according to the legislation, 1.3% would be realistic, and Oettinger wanted 1.2%, which led to a major upheaval there. So a strategy that is trying to send more money to Brussels in order to have um, a distribution of funding which makes more sense, I mean, this is a strategy that I wouldn't bet on actually, and the capabilities to shape things, to act of European policies at a different, is at a different level for the regional uh, ex 
change or regional balancing in order to set standards. For example, also in the field of our digitization policy, the EU has the objective to develop digital innovation hubs in different areas of Europe or to support them. And their main task is to support small and medium-sized businesses in their digitization process. And it was our position to achieve that the digital innovation hubs must have the same standards everywhere. So they should not only be effective in Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, for example, but also in the three um, areas in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, for example. They should be equally effective and helpful for the small and medium-sized businesses there. This is what the EU can do. The EU can set standards. It's quite similar to the task I tried to <clears throat> sketch out earlier when I was talking about the framework for social standards. Of course, the EU can not say what a minimum wage should look like, but the EU can say there needs to be a minimum wage. And I do think that, um, and I'm not quite sure, Lucas, whether this is correct, that this um, change towards more service or stronger service orientation means that uh, this leads to further demise of the rural areas, that it's to the disadvantage of rural areas. I mean, if we have a good broadband infrastructure in the rural areas, in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, for example, then a um, thriving business which offers services, for example, for accounting um, for major corporations can earn a lot of money and they can still remain in the rural areas. They do not have to go to Hamburg. But if the infrastructure is not there, then, of course, the rural areas will actually um, die down. And um, I would even argue to a certain degree that digitization can even have a balancing effect on the developments, because digitization allows us to develop industrial potential where we do not have um, all the, in the engineers right from the outset. So to a certain extent, the digitization is, has a balancing um, effect. So regions that are not so technologically strong can still participate in the overall competition. And this is why it is one of the major tasks, from my point of view, for the European institutions. The European institutions need to focus on the creation of the right framework conditions. Just one sentence, um, I mean, I don't want to uh, start a large debate on Keynes or um, not Keynes, but I do not fully agree that a competition is a negative word as such already. And already his yacht wrote that there are two kinds of competition. One is the destructive competition, which might go up until a war, and the other competition, which is the competition between singers, for example, or poets, which is quite a nice competition. And I think we should try to not consider competition as destructive as such. Uh, uh there is a response by Teresa, but I also would like to go back to the issue. Given the current situation in the European Parliament, uh, living political process in the Parliament, the uh, Council and the Commission, what scenario are possible? How can all these things be connected to give an answer to digitization, to take into consideration the changed geopolitical environment? What scenarios are conceivable? I would like to come back to this point, but first, Teresa, your response. 
Thank you. I would like first to address Lucas and then Reinhardt. Um, I think that we have to get rid of the national-international divide, both as an analytic category and as a category of practice, of political practice, if we want to understand the current situation and if we want to be able to intervene. So I definitely don't think that national data are the ones we should look at. Rather, we should look at how Europe, nation states and Europe together in a transnational way. And when I mean transnational, I don't need from the top of the EU to the bottom of the nation state. I, th I mean nation states have been the main drivers of their own transnationalization. So it's really a different way of thinking that we have to use. And I also think that we have to do the same operation with poli politics and economy. We have to get rid of this division. Economic issues are politics, and politics is economy. And we need to work at these two levels, getting rid of the national, transnational, national, international, and political economy oppositions in order to understand what is going on and on competition. Um, I think that I, I'm speaking about a very specific kind of competition. I, from, from my analytic perspective, I can say that the kind of competition that has been put in place by EU policies from the 90s at the regional, when I mean regional, I mean at the EU level, and uh, at the urban level, also always in a EU dimension, has been a neoliberal policy. And neoliberal competition is exactly what EU citizens have been reacting upon, mainly going to right-wing parties. So I think this is very important. We have to get rid of neoliberal competition. And I think this is a task that also um, goes to your uh, second question. Um, I think that one of the openings, so in Italy, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, the Partito Democratico, the Social Democrats, and then Forza Italia, so let's say the center-right parties, have collapsed, have given rise to a conservative answer, the yellow-green populist alliance. In Germany, I, I think that we have a similar situation. So the end of the Grosse Coalition, not for now, but you know the fact that this, this option is uh, on its, it's not the, the, the one for the future, opens up a space. And I think here it's very important that parties like the Green Party work in um, getting rid of what is the German version of neoliberalism that is ordo liberal policy for Germany and for Europe. And just on a final point, uh, to go back to the uh, countryside city um, opposition, for me, European citizenship means also the right to the city, meaning the right to the space, um, the right to housing, for example, uh, the right to a decent life in material and ecological conditions. And uh, in Switzerland, where I live, even though it's not a member state, but an associated country, there is also polarization, left-wing parties winning in the cities and right-wing parties, Eurosceptic parties winning in the countryside. We have to work very closely on that at the EU level. In, in Lombardia, the uh, region of the Northern League, Salvini won all over, but in Milano. We have to work on the countryside city divide. Okay, um, ich hoffe nicht, dass uh, Politik, Ökonomie und Ökonomie... I do not think that economy is policy and policy is economy. I hope policies are more than the economy. But we can come back to this. But let me come back to the scenario. What projects could really strengthen the European cohesion and master the challenges of the future, like digitization, etc.? What is conceivable? Reinhardt, 
you divided Europe once into different group of interest. The North is interested in stability, the South in solidarity, and the East in sovereignty. These are different directions. If you are interested in sovereignty, you may not be interested in having a big fund to generate risk funds for necessary for digitization and countries interested in stability may uh, be in favor. What would be conceivable compromises uh, the uh, European Parliament could agree on? <coughs> Industrial policies that are not in line with what a liberal commissioner once said, that economic policy is made well, but a policy that really sets political and economic framework conditions. Such a policy could help to create a bridge, an industrial policy that has an answer to the de-industrialization of certain spaces. It may uh, be a kind of social guarantor and also allow to shape the environment. If you are only a prolonged working bench, you have no practical power to shape things. So I think policies and that have a must have also a social component. So I see a, a policy that also deals with further training, how to fund the big tasks that people need to be re-skilled in future in order to stand a chance in the uh, labor market. This is also part of such an industrial policy. So it's not, it's more than human resources management. It goes far beyond it. Uh, second area, also an economic one, is the area of infrastructure development investments into infrastructure creates jobs to simplify things, but it also creates political stability and economic dynamism. So such an approach And I wouldn't take the original approach by Macron, who wants to have a special budget for the EU Eurozone. I think it should be expanded so that non Eurozone countries that want to participate should also be allowed. So, such an initiative. Pro would provide the potential to create such a bridge. And a third project that may sound surprising at a first glance is the issue of rule of law. Often scientists just see it in East European countries in Warsaw or Budapest. But this issue also exists in other countries here in Paris, in Italy, 
in Denmark thinking of the refugee policy pursued there. I think such policies for rule of law may be wagging uh, the finger, then it will be uh, divisive or we can uh, present it in a way with some uh, lect political lectures free of charge. Uh, this will also not be helpful or we can do it in a way and we have seen this recently when the European Commission took Poland to the European Court of Justice to get a sentence that laws contra contradicted uh, the law. So this was very successful in a European sense. The Polish Minister of Justice first said they would never accept a sentence and at the end the Polish government accepted the uh, decision by the European Court of Sentence. So I think common European policies can only be pursued if you do not assume everybody wants this same anyhow and then when you associate to certain lead concepts, then it means we have to pursue policies which is not simply in line with uh, German French condominium, but uh, policies that also involve Eastern Europeans into shaping these policies. I think this is important. And under, to reach an understanding, perhaps I'm a bit provocational when I say if only one country violates the European standards, then it is a violation. But if 10 or 15 countries do the same, it is no longer a deviation, it's a problem. And we have to treat it as a problem. So this is the first step, but then there are also some projects uh, where you can show that they are of relevance. Reinhardt, at different levels, you answered the question, what are conceivable projects? And Sven Giegold said before that the uh, political culture in the European Parliament must be developed, taking into consideration the different interests and that such a culture has now become compulsory. Lucas, before Anna will present her future projects, uh, Reinhardt spoke about infrastructure education. Is this uh, payable? It's not a question to fund it in Europe alone. The question is how to make it a political agenda. And uh, here also the member states and the EU level have to go together. And there are also possibilities not only to use budgetary funds, but also to fund it privately. What is important 
for all these scenarios. We need a commission that pushes ahead political projects. We need a team that is also prepared to be in conflict with the member states to reach a consensus for such a political agenda. The, and this is the interesting question in how far the next commission can be nailed down to such projects. It's not about a German-French condominium. And, uh, well, uh, there are no constructive talks with, I see, uh, German uh, Franco understanding uh, is a basic consensus to decide in what direction the EU has to go, though there must be an EU vision in Berlin. So the ball is in Berlin, in your opinion. Well, Anna has brought some future projects from a Hungarian perspective, and then I will give the floor to you. Thank you for what you said before. I think the attitude towards Eastern European countries, especially Hungary, should be changed. I mean, it's not helpful to take a high-handed approach. They, the, these countries have the feeling to be second-class citizens, and when they are patronized, then this only uh, helps Auburn uh, and the people can say there are double standards. So a solution would be a dialogue about a rule of law governed means. So we need more dialogue. We have to get out of our own filter machines. I have to talk to many people who vote for Auburn and to understand what their reasons are. I want to understand it. And I think it's also important between countries to talk more together. If you as Germans or from other countries come uh, meet somebody from Hungary, don't ask first about Auburn, but ask uh, how are you doing, what is your life. I think we need much more dialogue among ourselves to understand our lives better. And also in order to understand our traumas, our histories. And the second point would be uh, common border controls and a common European refugee policy. This would take the thunder away from the populace then uh, Auburn can no longer say we are the only ones to defend Europe. The Schengen borders concern all EU citizens. And I would also address the issue of clarity and transparency when it comes to weapon exports. This is a discourse in Hungary. Uh, Germany, France, and the U.S. are the biggest weapon exporters in the world. I didn't say they are the biggest, but they are among the biggest. Sorry. So you wonder what happens to these weapons? Where do they end up? And this easily leads to a discourse saying, well, these arms are used to wage wars, and then the refugees come into our countries, and we didn't, we are not the cause. It was Germany, France. The more transparency. I know it's very utopical what I'm saying. 
thank you. These were, and a last point, sorry. Rule of law I've mentioned, and the fifth point, Erasmus for all. Well, uh, Mary, uh, at the European level, this sentence was all already pronounced by Nietzsche, well, find a wife in a different country. Well, do as I did. I married a, fr a Frenchman, and now over dinner we speak about colonialism. And finally, I mean, he really uh, feels uh, that France has colonialized half of the world, so then we will understand better. So even the issue of colonialism has come up, and it is also uh, hotly debated. Anna, I leave it as that, as food for thought. So to give the audience the opportunity to make a comment or ask a question. There are mics. Please wait for the mic. First you and then the uh, gentleman in the white shirt. One comment about cohesion and the differences between member states. In the past, the European Union was a cohesion machine. You can see it in the UK, how poor it was when the UK joined and how rich it is now, and we will see what happens later. So the speed of cohesion is somewhat reduced. The East European countries really caught up, but the South European countries uh, fell back Cohesion is an important issue, and we must not forget that the difference between the mean income are in the EU are lower than the income gap between the uh, U.S. between U.S. states. So cohesion is working quite well. Well, funds from the uh, European budget to implement the rule of law. The European Union is ruled by law. So first, we need to have laws to say that it is possible. And there is the qualified majority, but the whole financial framework is decided by a unanimous vote. So such a demand is easy to make but difficult to implement. As to the influence of the Greens, here I would like to ask Reinhardt to tell us something more. What do you intend? Traditionally, the European Parliament once the uh, election of the uh, commission president is up, uh, the parliament formulates what should be on the agenda. So far, it was clear that uh, this was submitted to Juncker. Now we have three candidates for the job, what do the Green plans to ask question to the individual candidates what they want to include into their working program, or will it be by the whole parliament? And the last question so far, 
the commission had no right-wing populist members. Mogherini uh, from it Italy, because the populist uh, government came later, but now we have several such members. So these countries will propose uh, such people. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to include uh, another a question uh, second to you for, for uh, further contributions, one of the, the other. My name is Maximilian Gerk, uh, and I've got a question, uh, first of all, to Mr. Butikofa. You said that uh, e the EU needs to be capable of acting, in particular in between uh, the US and China, and we already heard the buzzword of qualified majority vote. So right now, foreign policy decisions are being taken based on a unanimous vote, which Require, which takes away a certain degree of flexibility. And my question is whether a qualified majority vote in the field of foreign policy would make sense for the EU, whether it's realistic with the new European Parliament, and what your views are on that. Next question, please. Hello, my name is Michelle Benzing. I would like to come back to the climate issue, and I would like to ask whether the climate issue played a role in the elections in Eastern European countries um, or was not such a big issue and where the issue will be in the future discussions within Europe and can this be a chance also um, or whether there will be a discussion between uh, climate uh, those who want to protect the climate and those who do not want to protect it. Um, yes, thanks for your question. Um, next question in the back. Janika Pramsen, Hertha School of Governance. I've got a question to Rainer Bütikofa. Um, apart from the overcoming of unanimity when it comes to foreign policy decisions, what kind of projects should the EU actually launch in order to have a voice in this conflict between the US and China. Thank you. Um, a few points. Uh, on the cohesion, a question maybe to Anna. Um, in the country I come from, Poland, the catch-up is going on, so the cohesion actually works. Uh, Poland is right now at about 70% of EU average uh, per capita, and uh, it continues to catch up. It, uh, so the process uh, and the debate uh, on the economy has shifted to the debate when the uh, cohesion will happen uh, rather than if, uh, point number one. Point number two, on equality, I fully agree about patronization and interference, but we need more, more of it. Um, patronization. Patr uh, not patronization, but interference. We need more interference, we need more debate that is transnational. I've been debating European issues in quite a few countries, and I can tell you that in my country, debates are only in Polish, uh, between Poles, very few international uh, speakers. Um, so they, it comes also in the context that about 52% of Poles have never left the country. Uh, also about 60% of Hungarians, if I remember correctly, have never left the country. Uh, so it, uh, the exposition towards the internationalization is much more reduced. And last point, it's EU is about solving problems. So it's extremely important to know what are the problems according to the people on the ground. And among those problems is also healthcare access to healthcare, quality of healthcare. Um, and it, this is particularly one topic that is very directly linked to migration of doctors, nurses uh, between, uh, between uh, various European countries. So the question to, um, to all of you pr probably about the European solution to the uh, health crisis when it comes to access to healthcare in certain European countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Peter. There are two further uh, 
questions on this side, and then we will be brief. I have to thank the interpreters um, who did a great job, I think. And uh, they can only stay here until 7 o'clock, so this is why we have to speed up a little bit. One question to Lukas Gutenberg. You said that a, there should be a German-French consensus where the EU or the other or between the other 26 member states. So why did you demand that? I took a look at your biography. You studied in France. Um, you also were in Harvard and a McCloy fellow. I think this. Uh, just a brief question, please. So close links with Wall Street. So my question is, who told you that, a Germ that there needs to be a German-French consensus um, to which the uh, other 26 member states should uh, agree? Well, final question. Well, we already mentioned the question of what kind of projects would make sense in order to make progress in Europe. What we've seen in the election so far is that um, a, a kind of domestic European policy has emerged. So I think it started with the election of the French president and it emanated from the nationalists and populists. But I think we can continue that in a positive sense. We need a more pan-European discussion, pan-European exchange, a media policy that goes into that direction. And we also mentioned infrastructure. And I think there are very many investments that would make sense. Um, and we should conceive it from a European perspective, not only because uh, it leads to economic advantages, but it's also a question of, I mean, if we introduce certain standards, um, in certain regions that they are not available because everything is organized privately, for example, the digitization or transportation infrastructure. So this means that the um, disparities between different regions or states would even increase. And thirdly, competition. We can have competition between states or between companies. And as we can do not make up for certain disparities, that, I mean, you don't tackle certain tax issues, you don't deal with certain questions um, um, about level playing field, um, equal opportunities. So we have competition at the state level. Um, some can compete, others can't, but we prevent the competition at the company level. So um, it's very single-sided to say, well, it's just competition. Thank you very much, Stefan. So these were quite a few questions. We have five minutes left. I would like Anna to start. And one after the other, you can give the answers to the questions that were directed at you. And finally, Reinhard, until our technician turns off the electricity. Was in English. So first, climate. Uh, in Hungary, the Green Party have just el basically eliminated themselves uh, during the elections. So uh, no, uh, climate did not was not the decisive uh, topic of the elections. Uh, as for my uh, Polish uh, colleague, uh, I totally agree with you that uh, dialogue is extremely important and that intervention through legal means and uh, legal sanctions is important. But without a patronizing tone. That's what I, that's what I meant. Uh, as for um, healthcare, it is a serious problem in Hungary. Uh, and deep poverty is a serious problem as well, which has not been solved ever since uh, the uh, change of the, the political system. Uh, and yes, a uh, large part of, uh, of Hungarians have, uh, do, do not have the means to travel. So this is a, an issue we share. I am one of the lucky ones. Yeah. Uh, to the first comment on cohesion, for me, Brexit shows that there is a problem of cohesion because we have a part of the EU territory leaving, so it's very clear. Then on a more general level, the question is, how do we understand cohesion at the scale of the continent? So it's a question of categories. On healthcare, 
The point is exactly that health cannot be privatized. We cannot have competition and privatization over health care. Otherwise, we destroy the idea of Europe. Um, on uh, to Deutschland, Frank. As regards France, I think this was a misunderstanding. Um, um, to, um, it's wrong to say that Germany and France should decide what the others should agree to. But if you take a look at history, then um, this happened in the past. So Germany and France went into one direction, but were also able to um, um, gain majorities and to create a consensus. And then we were able to make progress. If this did not happen, if Germany and France did not agree, then it was difficult. On the question of um, health, um, the health sector, I think we have to take care that we do not demand too much from the EU. I mean, there are certain areas that are clearly national competencies, and of course, the health sector is part of it. And it would be wrong to uh, demand things from the EU which the EU cannot fulfill. Your questions on the competition, Peter, and the contributions that the stronger country should make. Sorry, without the mic, I cannot interpret. Just repeat the question briefly. Well, then I do not have to comment it uh, any further. So, well, then we should come to Michelle's question um, uh, and the Green Parliamentary Group. Well, we do not know yet what we are negotiating right now. We assume that we managed to start negotiations this week. If we were to succeed, I think we should agree on six different points. We should agree on the labor program of the Commission. This is indispensable. We should agree on the joint attitude towards the um, budget negotiations. We should agree on the strange collaboration of four parliamentary groups and how we deal with um, quarrels, how can we deal with contradictions? We should also come to an agreement on the strengthening of democratic processes, for example, the role of the European Parliament as a whole and how we can strengthen it institutionally. Manfred Weber, for example, during his electoral campaign said that he wants to introduce the right to launch initiatives from the European Parliament. And this is something that, from my point of view, we can do without changing the treaties through institutional agreements between the Parliament and the Commission. And this would actually be a very important strengthening of the European Parliament. And it would also be a strengthening of the democracy if we would um, reinforce the European citizens' initiatives by um, allowing them to gather signatures electronically. And then, of course, we will also have to agree on personnel, um, the commission president or the president of the parliament. This is what we need to discuss. From our point of view, from the point of view of the Greens, it is quite clear that in terms of the labor program, climate needs to be at the top of the agenda. And I mean, many people have already mentioned that um, we need to put a price tag on carbon dioxide in what form ever. This would be a decisive issue. I could not imagine the Greens to agree to any uh, agreement without this being part of the deal. I neither think that this is not part of the discussions in those countries where the Greens did not succeed. So in Poland, for example, the Greens are not able to send a member to the European Parliament, but they were part of the coalition of five parties, um, Citizens Platform, Socialists, Liberals, the uh, Peasants, and the Greens. and. Um, 
the issue of climate and energy was on top of their agenda. And the new party, Vyosna, also made the um, exit of coal a topic. So coal played a bigger role in this electoral, uh, in these elections than in the past in Poland. Uh, concerning the question of foreign policy, qualified majorities, I mean, I'm in favor of it. I don't think that um, we will be able to implement this as a general principle without any changes or amendments to the treaties. But um, there is the so-called passerelle clause, which stipulates that for those topics where ministers were able to come to unanimous decision once, they do not need to come to another unanimous decision. They can operate with qualified majority in the future. I could imagine that the process could be as such. With topics where the contradictions are in too high or the views are quite similar, the ministers could come to an agreement on this specific topic, for example, the European policy towards Namibia, that there is no further need for unanimity. And this could set an example and show that it works out even without unanimity. And then we could try to um, uh, govern more and more different areas based on the principle. The leading nations like, um, for example, Germany or France could explain or could state that they are not going to veto it. Of course, you cannot be forced to come to a unanimous decision, but you could um, state bindingly that you are not going to veto it. And this might be um, quite an inter interesting development. And I think we could um, achieve something here um, concerning the objectives, foreign policy objectives. I would say that uh, high on top of my list is the question of the integration of the Western Balkans. This is an unsolved issue. If we don't manage to solve it in the next five to 10 years, I fear that it will be an ongoing open wound. And we can already imagine how the Russian uh, or Chinese or uh, governments or others are trying to interfere uh, more and more strongly and to lead to more uh, appeals there. And secondly, I do think that Europe should take its connectivity strategy seriously, which means finding own ways to invest into infrastructure in those countries uh, in which China uh, makes an offer uh, with, with the Silk and Road, um, Belt and Road Initiative. And um, the some governments say, well, um, just give me a different offer, then I'll tell you what I think of the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is exactly the point. So I think Europe should make a major effort to come to a partnership um, with Africa. I mean, they're only um, a hesitant attempts, but not a real um, overall concept to do this. I think Europe should invest much more to strengthen the role of the euro internationally. We can see the importance of it in the Iran conflict. I think Europe should find a way to have a more active foreign trade policy linked to good ecological and social standards. And I think that Europe uh, in the field of security should, above all, be an actor and player in the field of cybersecurity. I think we have a lot to offer here, which we do not have in other security-related issues. These were some priorities that I think are important for foreign policy. And last uh, answer concerning the question um, uh, on the um, difficult um, candidates for the European Commission. I mean, this might indeed become a bigger problem than the populist or nationalist parties in, in the parliament. However, 
this is not yet uh, finalized, not yet determined. We, for example, say that the Commission president should demand from the member states that every member state suggests two persons, a man and a woman. This would already allow us to um, uh, reject someone who is unbearable. And also gender parity might be quite useful here. And secondly, the European Parliament has turned down unacceptable candidates in the past already, and it will do so again. And this is why we need a strong European Parliament. And Jean-Claude Juncker had already mentioned how the structuring of the European Commission um, and looked like in 2014, um, uh, he has shown how it works. I mean, the, you can introduce hierarchies in the um, European Commission so that uh, those commissioners can do much who are act actually acting against everybody else. So I'm not really fearful in this regard. Thank you very much, dear Reinhardt. A round of applause is quite justified here. Uh, we have reached not only the end of this panel, but of a very intensive uh, afternoon on European policy. I thank you all, and I wish you a nice evening. I'd like to remind you that uh, you should uh, fill in the evaluation here. Um, this is a uh, um, uh, uh, page of paper that you can get everywhere here. So have a safe trip home. And um, the group knows where the group should meet, which is downstairs. So thank you very much and have a nice evening.